we're going to talk about Istio, where Istio is today, and where Istio is headed tomorrow. Super, super excited to be here with Mitch Connor. So if you allow me to quickly introduce myself. I got you. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, yeah, my name is Lin Sang. I'm working on open source as Solo. Prior to join Solo, I was a senior technical staff member at IBM. I wrote two books about Istio. One is Istio Explained. How many of you uh, actually read that book before? All right, a few of you. And I just published a new book, Istio Ambient Explained. Uh, so very excited about that. I work in the Istio Steering Committee and Technical Oversight Committee. Yeah, and now I'm going to pass on to Mitch. Hey, everybody. I think I've met a lot of you. My name is Mitch. I'm a software engineer at Google. Uh, I joined the Istio project way back in 2018, and I'm very fortunate to serve on the TOC today. Uh, I hold the dubious distinction of having the largest handcrafted commit in, the Istio, or in any Istio repository. Not sure that's something I should be bragging about. In my defense, most of those lines are deletes rather than additions, so it's not as bad as it looks. Uh, I also had the privilege of being a guest on the Kubernetes podcast. Check out episode 177 to hear about Istio just from a few months back, uh, especially with an ex the exciting announcement of the donation to the CNCF and a few other things. So we said we were going to talk about Istio today and tomorrow, and I'm going to cover mostly the today section. I'm going to use the keyboard. Uh, how many of you guys are actively using a service mesh in production today? All right, wow, OK. And if you're not, how about how many of you are evaluating service mesh usage? Cool, and if you're not doing either of those, you probably are in the wrong room, but you're welcome to stick around. We're happy you're here. Uh, service mesh usage is uh, really, really taking off worldwide, and the CNCF survey from 2021 showed that there's a shift into production that we're seeing. Uh, you know, For the last five years or so, it was a very exciting topic. Everybody was talking about it, but it wasn't really making its way into production. So we've sort of crossed that gap and are moving on towards maturity in the industry as a whole and Istio is no different. Um, we have a great community behind the Istio project that I'm very proud of. We have 397 community members, and that's growing every day. It's, actually, I wrote that last week, so we probably have a few more already. And we've got 50 maintainers, seven working groups with 15 leads. In the last 28 days, there have been 435 developers who have contributed to Istio. Now, this is not just pull requests. This could count if you've made a comment or opened a GitHub issue, if you've asked a question on any of our forums. Uh, we count that as activity in the community. Uh, so hopefully a lot of you already are counted in that 435, and those of you who aren't, uh, we welcome you to jump in, get involved, ask questions, answer questions, let us know what's broken, what's working well. Uh, and th those 435 developers were spread off uh, across 124 companies. You can, by the way, follow these stats on your own. CNCF collects them at devstats.cncf.io uh, for all of their projects. So really proud of the community that we've built. And it, since particular, this is the maintainer track, I'll ask you, can you stand up if you're an Istio maintainer or have served as one in the past? All right, we got a couple spread throughout. So our maintainers are hard at work uh, making sure that pull requests and issues are handled in a prompt uh, manner, making sure that new features as they roll out are stable and meet the bar of quality that we've set for you, our users, and uh, we, have a great, we have a great team going on there. So in uh, April, we had IstioCon virtually, which was uh, really exciting. Happy to not be virtual anymore, but we were thankful for what we had. And we laid out the roadmap for Istio along a few dimensions. We said that we wanted to go for stability, particularly API stability. If you've noticed, there's a lot of APIs in the Istio ecosystem, the Istio CRDs that are V1 alpha or V1 beta. Uh, we want to see those moving towards V1 uh, because we want to be able to communicate to our users clearly that we expect these APIs to stay consistent. So there's a lot of pressure for maturity and promotion there. Uh, we wanted to make upgrades and troubleshooting easier. We heard loud and clear that day two operations for Istio is more expensive than it needs to be. And so we're working at improving that experience. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. 
Uh, improved extensibility through the WASM layer. We talked about expanding Istio's reach with IPv6 and ARM support and others, security harding, hardening, upgrade automation. All in all, all of these things were focused around the central theme of improving day two operations. If you're not familiar with the phrase day two operations, day zero is sort of you're testing it out where most people were in service mesh three to four years ago. Day one is installation and setup. We spent a lot of time honing that uh, back in 2019, trying to make it better. We feel like it's a pretty good experience today. Day two is keeping the lights on, making sure that every time there's a CVE related to Istio or Envoy or data plane, you're getting your deployments, uh, your Istio control plane up to date, your Istio data planes re-injected so that you're protected against those CVEs. Also troubleshooting, when the mesh starts doing something that you didn't expect it to do. Um, our day two story is improving, and we're gonna look at that in a little bit. It's still got a ways to go, and so that's still what we're working on today. So let's take a look back and ask how we've done. In terms of API stability this year, uh, 113 saw the workload group go to beta. And by the way, internally at the Istio project, we use beta as the signal that it's production ready. If it's alpha, we would advise you not to deploy the API in production. It may disappear in the future, but beta has a, has a support policy of I think it's longer than three months. I think it might be a year. Anyways, has an extended support policy and we are very careful not to deprecate or to modify beta APIs in breaking ways. That being said, we do still wanna take these to V1. Uh, AuthZ dry run, so that you can see how your AuthZ policy is going to apply to traffic before hitting the go button and accidentally breaking some really important traffic, uh, has graduated alpha. 115, which, saw, which launched in August, saw Istio Cuddle uninstall go to beta. Uh, it's now a little bit safer for you to just kick the tires on Istio, and then if you decide that it's not for you, you can use the uninstall command and we will remove every trace that Istio was on your system. Uh, and then 116 release is coming up, I think, next week. We'd better get back to work. Uh, it, it's coming up really soon, and you are gonna see the JOT, or web token-based uh, routing, graduate to alpha, as well as external AuthZ graduating to beta, so that you can run integrations with your own AuthZ systems. Looking at how we've done on upgrades, we have upgrade surveys. If you've ever used Istio Cuddle install or the Helm chart to install Istio, there should be a little message right at the end of the script that outputs on your terminal and just says, hey, looks like you just upgraded Istio, let us know how you did. And hundreds of you have, or not how you did, how we did. Hundreds of you have clicked the link and let us know how we're doing on upgrades. We would love to hear from hundreds more. Uh, the overall story is that we're seeing consistent improvement from one release to the next in upgrade stability, which is a key metric that we're tracking for our day two operations. We're also still hearing very clearly that upgrades are still very hard, that our users are still struggling with it. So while we've seen a lot of improvement, we don't believe that we're done yet. Uh, I mentioned ARM support. We've seen a uh, bill of materials added in 113 and future releases and we're quickly working on getting towards Salsa level one compliance for the project as a whole. Uh, we also have published an integration with Flux for upgrading your Istio installs automatically with the click of a pull request. So we're sort of reaching out and broadening our scope, working with partners in the ecosystem to make your lives easier. And I think that was it, right? Oh, there was, there was one more thing. We're here. <laughs> Uh, this is Istio's first time at KubeCon as a, I have already clicked the button, I'm sorry, I'm stealing Lynn's slides. Uh, this is our first time at KubeCon as an actual cloud native project. We've been lurking in the shadows for years. Uh, we've been submitting CFPs as a envoy based service mesh that would remain anonymous so that we wouldn't get kicked out for talking about the wrong project. But now we're here, we're an incubating project, and we hope to see graduation in the near future. So we're very, very excited about, oh, and because of that, you can go to the Istio booth in the pavilion, which I'm really excited about. Uh, we have maintainer track sessions, and we have multiple users sharing throughout the week about their experience using Istio, as well as, I think, a session on Ambient, or no, Gateway API uh, with Rob Scott. Yeah. Um, you can get your free T-shirt at Istio booth. Sorry, we, we forgot to bring any of the T-shirt here. And uh, how many of you are excited about Istio being part of CNCF? Show your hands. Yeah! 
Yeah, thank you so much, Mitch. That's a great overview of what we have done in the Istio community. I feel I learned a few things from you, too. All right, so now let's talk about the future of Istio. Uh, we, I want to start talk about sidecars, right? Uh, as much we love about sidecar, there are some challenges with sidecar. The first challenge in my perspective, actually in the community perspective, I shouldn't say just my perspective, is about the transparency of the sidecar, right? If you ever use the sidecar, you probably remember you have to inject the sidecar, right? It's kind of a baby you have to carry with your application container and you have to keep upgrading it whenever there's an Envoy CVE, right? So it's the operation burden on you to be able to manage and upgrade uh, that sidecar. And then if you ever have an uh, init container or if you have your own sidecar with your application, a lot of times there could be conflicts with our own init container or with our own sidecar. And if you ever have any sequence issue between startup, the application container, and the sidecar, also at the shutdown time, uh, there could be a sequence issue. How many of you had those issues? Yeah, some of you, for sure. <laughs> we totally understood, right? That's why we were thinking about, you know, what about not sidecar? So if you are also using our server-first protocol, if you're using Kubernetes jobs, unfortunately, it still today doesn't support Kubernetes jobs or server-first protocol, like MySQL, so that's another challenge with sidecar. So in the nutshell, it's not transparency. Some of you raise your hand, so you probably hit those surprises along the way, and it takes time to troubleshooting. And the other thing about the sidecar is even though we do say it's, you can adopt Istio incrementally, right? If you need Metro TLS, or if you need traffic shifting, or if you need uh, telemetry, you can adopt Istio incrementally based on the feature you need. Uh, but with sidecar, it's yes or no, right? You, regardless of whether you need one feature or three feature, you have to do the sidecar because there's no incremental in between. Uh, so you pay for the price of the sidecar even though you just need mutual TLS. If you just need some basic layer for RBAC, you still have to get the sidecar running and operate it. Um, Yep, so that's the other challenge of Saika. The, the, the last challenge I would highlight with Saika is over-provisioning the resource um, because you don't have a choice to say, I don't want Saika on my part for for maybe I you run 10 replica, you only want uh, two of your uh, application part to run sidecar, you're eight, you don't want the sidecar, you don't have that choice. You have to drag it down for every single part in your replica. So uh, even though you could potentially have, just have two or three parts do the layer seven processing job for you. So that's the other challenging with sidecar. So how many of you have heard Istio Ambient Service Mesh? Wow, many of you more than I expected, so good job, guys. Um, so if you recall, um, on istio.io, on the blog page, we published three blogs between engineers from Solo and Google to talk about how, uh, why we launched Istio Ambient Service Mesh. What are the, how do you get started with Istio Ambient Service Mesh uh, in a few minutes, and what are the security trade-off between Istio Ambient Service Mesh to sidecars? Um, so that's super exciting. So we launched that, I believe, on September 7th. So we tweeted out that. I actually tweeted for the Istio project. And what's also really reassuring to us is Matt Klein, who is a founder of Envoy, and uh, really endorsed the architecture we put out for Istio regarding this new site architecture for Ambient. So that's really, really cool. So today, I want to take you through a quick overview of what Istio Ambient Service Mesh is. Um, the time is going to be a little bit limited given the time of our session. I'll try to do my best. So essentially, in a nutshell, uh, Istio Ambient Mesh introduced a two-layer approach. So you can have a multi-tenancy per node uh, secure overlay layer, uh, which is provided by this component called Z-Tunnel. Uh, so that provides uh, Z 
zero, I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong button. That provide the zero trust the mutual TLS for you, provide layer four enforcement for you, that provides layer four telemetry for you. So that is multi-tenancy serving all the paths co-located on that particular node that Zeta node is running. So with this architecture, you no longer need to run sidecar, so it's more transparent for your application. You don't have to restart your application part. You can just um, include your application as part of the mesh uh, through a label technique. Uh, so it's reduce uh, compute cost, and uh, it simplify operation, and also the transparency, uh, make it really transparent to your application. Uh, the second, uh, the two layer approach, the second layer is the layer seven processing layer because we know uh, Envoy was not designed to be multi-tenancy. Um, Envoy has issues when it's running multi-tenancy with noise label, with isolation, with cost attrition. So uh, we want to make sure the layer seven processing layer provided by Envoy is single tenancy. So you are typically going to see that uh, in ambient, that's going to be per service account or per namespace, whichever tenancy model you feel comfortable. So uh, we call that a waypoint proxy. So that can, uh, it's running outside of your application part and can provide all the layer seven functionality you need. Um, so yeah, so that's essentially is the ambient architecture um, uh, what's really interesting with the Istio control plan, so Mitch talk about 1.16. So one of the important features of 1.16 is that we actually added support in the sidecar today so that sidecar in 1.16 or newer can talk to pods in ambient through either Z-Tunnel or Waypoint proxy so they can interoperate, which is really, really cool. Because I believe maybe you have a strong case, you, you want to continue to use Saika, which is totally cool, or maybe you want some of your application gradually move to ambient, and then you can continue to talk to each other. So um, as far as install ambient, it's really easy. How many of you know is your installation profile? How many of you install is still using the profile, right? Most people are using default profile or you customize your profile. So ambient is the installation profile that we provided in the Istio project. It's an experimental profile at the moment because it's not production ready yet, but we do expect the ambient profile become the default when it's production ready. So essentially you use the Istio Cardo to install uh, ambient service mesh, it's just one single command to get it installed and essentially install the Istio CNI, the Z tunnel as the daemon said, running in every single node in your Kubernetes cluster and the Istio control plane and the Istio ingress gateway. So uh, let's talk about if you want your application to be part of the ambient, what you need to do, right? So the only thing you need to do is a uh, label on your namespace. For instance, you just label it to be uh, data plane mode ambient, and then every single path in that namespace without any change to your existing path or any change to any of the new parts you are deploying to your namespace, it's going to be automatically part of ambient. So that's really the transparency, the simplification of operation I was talking about earlier. And then this is the two layer architecture approach uh, where we have a secure transport layer that's provided by Zetunnel, which is multi-tenancy per node that handles zero trust and layer four enforcement for you. And then we have the waypoint proxy, by the way, which is optional. You only need the waypoint proxy if you need layer seven processing. So uh, when you find out some of your application may need um, layer seven processing, then you deploy the waypoint proxy, but it's optional, you don't have to. Um, so this is really uh, different than the sidecar approach. So it's more gradually incremental adoption. All right, so let's take a uh, deep dive a little bit more onto the secure uh, overlay layer. So what happens when application A is going to talk to application B, right? So before application A attempts to talk to application B, the Z tunnel here is uh, automatically programmed uh, as a certificate authority client 
to talk to Israel control plane. So it has the application A certificate to be able to impersonate on behalf of application A. Also, the Z-Tunnel is served as a XDS uh, client, so it gets the configuration from the Israel control plane. So it knows uh, whether the uh, application B whichever Z-Tunnel it needs to go to, and it also knows whether application B has a waypoint proxy. So in this case, you are going to see application A is uh, sending traffic uh, to application B. That traffic is going to be redirect to the Z-Tunnel located on the same node. So that's plain text. And then once the traffic reaches the Z-Tunnel, the Z-Tunnel is going to check, is there any existing tunnel exists between the um, service account A that app A used to the service account B that app B is using. If there's any existing tunnel, it's going to try to reuse the existing tunnel. If there's um, not any existing one, it's going to create new tunnel. So this tunnel is uh, what, what we call HTTP over uh, H-bone encapsulation, which we're going to talk about a little bit more, but it, everything here is mutual TLS. It's very similar to what you see from uh, Saika to Saika today, except that it's encrypted with Edgebone. And then when the traffic reaches the destination Z-Tunnel, uh, it can base on the original destination source and forward to the destination, which is application B here. Now, in the case of application B it does have a waypoint proxy. Remember we talk about waypoint proxy? It's going to be optional, right? So if the app does need layer seven processing, um, so the Z-Tunnel on the source side is going to be smart to know by Istio control plane sending the configuration. So it knows the destination has a waypoint proxy. So it's going to send the traffic to the waypoint proxy first uh, through the HTTP, uh, the HBOM tunnel and which forwards the traffic to the destination Z tunnel. Um, so it's just going to have an actual hop and that actual hop does the layer seven uh, traffic shifting, the layer seven policy enforcement, the layer seven uh, telemetry collecting, so it does a lot of layer seven magic in that waypoint proxy. So in a nutshell, the two uh, layers we talk about is a key innovation in ambient. So it separates the layer four layer and the layer seven layer um, based on your business need. So you can choose uh, the secure overlay layer, which is primarily layer four, and uh, optionally you can add uh, the layer seven processing as needed. All right, so this is HTTP-based overlay network. So that's when the Z-Tunnel talks to from source to destination or the Z-Tunnel talks to the waypoint proxy. So what exactly is HBone, right? So it's all the traffic tunneled through a single mutual TLS uh, communication using a HTTP2 uh, connect tunnel. And uh, it actually fixed some of our problems we have in the sidecar world that it no longer requires um, the metadata exchange uh, stack. It allows us to run Kubernetes jobs and uh, it fixed like the server um, uh, speak first protocol, uh, which we had issue with Saika, so it's very, very uh, nice. So this is a typical a tunnel looks like where you could have multiple requests flow through the tunnel, so the tunnel is per source service account uh, and uh, target service account pair, um, and it's on 15008 port by default in Istio. Um, let's talk about security, right? Because I'm sure you've been wondering about it's still ambient service mesh. How is the security compared with Saika, right? If particularly if you're already comfortable with Saika today. So one question I would ask is, um, out of the, all the Envoy CVE, how many of you know uh, how many of the CVE are layer four related and how many of the CVEs are layer seven related? Does anyone have a rough answer? All right, so I can tell the answer. So we did a rough study uh, in the past two years. It's about a third of the CVEs are layer four related, and most of the other CVEs are layer seven related, right? So what does this mean? So if you just need layer four functions, running in Z-Tunnel is actually way more secure because, you know, 
two thirds of the CVE is not going to apply to you, right? So the problem of uh, you know running a minimize of Z tunnel um, compared with a full blown sidecar, you really reduce your attack surface from that perspective. So that's really cool. Um, so you can think about uh, multi tenancy Z tunnel. Think about if that Z tunnel is compromised, it's similar as the sidecar on that node, every single sidecar on the node is compromised. And in theory, if you know how to compromise Z tunnel, you know how to compromise every single sidecar on that node. But the reverse is not true because if you know how to compromise a sidecar, doesn't mean you can compromise the Z tunnel because Z tunnel has much reduced surface of attack. So that's for the secure overlay layer. Now for the layer seven processing layer, it's, extend, it's designed to be single tendency, so it's very similar as sidecar, so it's to eliminate all the noise label, cost attrition issues with multi-tenancy. That's why we don't do a low level layer seven envoy. We don't believe in the community that's the right approach. And all of you know, we don't write perfect code, right? And we know that from the Istio project. So if you are application developer, you probably could be right, uh, pulling out libraries that have your CVE or your code maybe have CVE, right? So in the sidecar world, when your application container got compromised, it could potentially have access to the sidecar because they are co-located and potentially have the access to the rest of the services and it's your control plane. But in ambient, if your application container is compromised, the, the surface is much, much reduced because you can't do much. You can't really you know, compromise the Istio control plane simply because your application is compromised. So that's really cool. So we believe um, even though ambient is an experimental branch, it's new. We believe when it's production ready, it's going to be uh, as secure as sidecar and potentially even more secure than the sidecar. With that, um, I think we have time, hopefully, to take some questions. Yeah. Uh, this is a survey by uh, the session provided by CNCF. Certainly, if you put your uh, phone towards the QR code, we would love, love your feedback. And I think we have time for questions. All right, <laughs> lots of questions. How I think we have a roving mic, and we've got a question up front. Yeah, thank you. So the roadmap for all of our features goes from experimental to alpha to beta. And we advise that our users not uh, deploy to production until a minimum of beta for the feature. So we're actively working on getting ambient mesh out of experimental phase and into alpha. Our internal goals are, are to have that relatively soon. I would say in H1 of 2023, we hope to have it available at least as an alpha, potentially even as a beta on that time frame. For now, we'd love for you to kick the tires. Let us know what you think. It is a work in progress, so there's a handful of things we know are broken, probably some others that we don't know, and it would be great if you could tell us. Yeah, and also we have weekly ambient contributor meetings on Wednesday. I actually run those meetings, and Mitch helped me run them too. So we would love to hear feedback from you guys, and also have you guys contribute to ambient, right? Even though if it's documentation, testing, you know, it's going to really help the project mature, and we want to be partner with you, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. So, um, in the situation where you have uh, two different six applications running that are running in separate namespaces, um, previously with the sidecar, you were able to get the MCLS all the way from that and fully set up, uh, segregate those two pods. In the Z tunnel, it looks like you could theoretically go from pod A to pod B, and each uh, and just each without that MCLS. Is that uh, a so you always have to go through the Z tunnel because uh, the way we have is we have IP table redirect and routes. So all the incoming and outgoing traffic to any of the pods, as long as they are part of the ambient, it always needs to go through the co-located Z tunnel. Um, so the way to think about it is um, the 
the traffic between the sidecar and the application container is plain text, right? The, which is very similar as the traffic between your application container to Z-Tunnel, which is also plain text, right? So that surface area is the same. If somebody has privilege to get onto the node to run like the network monitoring, they will be able to sniff that traffic between your application container to sidecar or between your application container to the Z-Tunnel. Does that make sense? Yeah, great question. And if you want the book, yeah. Oh, sorry. Throw so, out. Oh, thank you. My question was. Okay, thank you. My question was actually very similar to one here. Under 15 FTC, one for the direct communication between D tunnel and D tunnel, and A of one node wanted to talk to B on the middle. And in other scenarios, Okay, yeah, do you want me to take that? Or? So you're asking when is the waypoint proxy required and when is it not? Yeah. yeah. So the waypoint exactly. proxy's job is as a policy enforcement point for L7 telemetry. Or, sorry, for L7. So if you need anything L7 from your service mesh, be it route or path-based routing or uh, header-based routing or L7 telemetry yeah. or uh, L7 authorization policies, then you need a waypoint proxy for that service. And none of those will operate until you've installed a waypoint proxy using the gateway API. Yeah, so basically you have the choice. You tell it's your control plane through the gateway resources to deploy the waypoint proxy if you need it. But it's optional and up to you yeah. to decide. We won't run any proxies you don't want. Yeah, the, which is, you know, cost of saving, right? Why would we, you pay extra if you don't need it? So if, if you don't deploy waypoint proxies, then the communication will happen through Z, Z tunnel through Z tunnel. Yes, yeah. if you don't deploy a waypoint proxy, it'll be only L4. You'll have all the encryption you need every time you leave the node, but none of your L7 stuff will work. Yeah, you will get layer 4 telemetry, though. Yeah, even with Z tunnel. And you will get layer 4 tra uh, policy enforcement. So you could have, like, basic RBAC. Yeah. Great question. Do uh, we? Yeah, uh, you in one of the slides you said the enable is the metadata exchange hack. What is that? Can you explain that? Yeah. That's, uh, that's what we use for um, telemetry uh, in Istio in the sidecar world. So if you install Istio, there's uh, metadata filters installed for the telemetry we use to collect the metrics uh, in sidecar, yeah. Do you want to add anything? No, I think that covered it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. So there are two different projects, uh, and we have two completely different uh, teams of maintainers and developers. The yeah. folks at Open Service Mesh are developing an awesome Envoy-based service mesh. Uh, it, in that sense, it is similar to Istio, but its emphasis is going to be different. Um, you really shouldn't ask me too much about OSM. We're competitors. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but I mean, the OSM team has great people here. You can talk to Keith Maddox at the OSM booth. Um, I, I, I've answered and dodged the question at the same time. Yeah, we could be biased. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, but I mean, the one thing though, I do really recommend you to check out CNCF survey because the survey doesn't lie, right? So if you go to survey, you can see, you know, what's the most popular service mesh, what's the, the most uh, deployed in production service mesh. Yeah, so check those out. In the proof of concept, that's correct. Uh, but with the new modes supported for daemon set rollout strategies, we believe that we can either eliminate or minimize the amount of time that, that there's an outage to something under a half a second is yeah. kind of our target. Yeah, and the other thing you want to think about Z-Tunnel is as your CNI, right? When your CNI, whether it's Calico or Cilian, that's being upgraded, it might take a minor hits on the environment, right? So you want to budget your application to be higher available across different uh, nodes too. Also, if half a second is the wrong number, 
Uh, if you actually don't care that much and five seconds is no problem, or if half a second is way too long, please come to the Istio booth and tell us about your use case. This is the perfect time to have input into the development of Ambient and how we steer the project. So the labeling experience is consistent between the two. The label is different for ambient versus sidecar service mesh. Uh, the big difference being that when you're using sidecars, once you've labeled a namespace, all the pods that are running in that namespace are immutable. So we can't just add a sidecar next to them. We have to actually have you restart all of the workloads in that namespace, which causes them all to be recreated. And at that creation time, we're able to inject a new sidecar into each of those new pods. With Ambient, on the other hand, because we don't need a sidecar running in every pod, we're able to capture the traffic dynamically without restarting or interrupting any of the existing workloads. Yes, you, you don't have to move everything onto Ambient at the same time. You can have a mix of Ambient, Sidecar, and non-meshed services all communicating. Now, you can shoot yourself in the foot. If you turn on MTLS strict enforcement, all of those services that don't have a Sidecar or Ambient now just can't communicate with the other ones. Uh, but by default, you can communicate between them. Yeah, so you can continue to stay on the sidecar just because you feel more comfortable with sidecar. The project is not going to you know, push you in one direction or the other. Certainly we recommend Ambient when it's production ready, but you can gradually move when you, whenever you feel comfortable. Yeah, there's no rush, and they can talk to each other too. Uh, Yeah, so that's the 116 I was mentioning. So we added Edgebone support in Envoy. Uh, it's your Envoy proxy in 1.16. So in order for any pods in Istio with Saika to talk to uh, pods in Ambient, they would have to be Istio 116 or later. So I'll put on my user experience hat and say that sidecars or sidecarless themselves, you, you shouldn't actually care about. What you want is a mesh that's easy to onboard, that's easy to maintain and keep up to date, and that is computationally efficient and doesn't add too much latency. And oh, simple. <laughs> but yeah, it's also simple, sim simple, to, simple to use and configure. Yeah. If you get those five things out of a service mesh, whether it's being implemented in sidecars or in ambient mode or inside the kernel or by camels carrying packets back and forth across the Sahara, you should not care. Uh, the, the bottom line is what you care about is the features of your mesh. We believe ambient mesh and the sidecarless model will give you a better user experience than you have today with a sidecar model in Istio, and that's why we're moving there. Yeah. But we don't want our users necessarily to be over-focused on the implementation details. We would like you to see the end results of why it's better. Yeah, you got to pick, and even though we believe Ambient is better because it's long intrusive, it's more transparent to you, and it has a better onboarding experience we can provide. Yeah, but you, you guys are really going to let me know and let us know yeah. maybe in six months, yeah, or even now if you are willing to try Ambient in experimental mode. Do we have time for more questions? So. Yeah. 
Yeah, so if, if you have a multi-tenancy model that you have separate workloads that you identify differently, but you're using the same service account for them, you have much bigger problems than your service mesh. Uh, you should have one service account per logical service. Uh, things that should not, uh, could harm one another, if you have a Coke and Pepsi situation of multi-tenancy, you absolutely need to have separate service accounts for those. And then your waypoint proxy will also reflect that with those separate service accounts. Yeah, that's exactly why we believe this is the right architecture to allow you still have single tenancy on layer seven processing because they typically are pretty noisy and most of the scenario you may want to extend it using like WASM. Um, so it's good to be single tenancy. So I think there were questions that we couldn't get to. Uh, we'll be at the East Istio booth. I'll be there for the booth crawl tonight from six to eight. I'd love to have you stop by and have a chat about how you're using Service Mesh. Yeah, and we'll be handing out our uh, uh, Istio ambient book. So if you want to read up on that book, I'll be at the uh, solo booth and also the Istio booth too. Yeah, thank you so Thanks, much everybody. for joining.